he wants to make the world a better place, but at the same time, your background is in military science, isn't it? <laughs> right, yeah. It's a bit of a paradox. I right. leave the floor to you. The title of the presentation is Applied Crypto Economics Creating a Sustainable DAO. Enjoy a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Is this the clicker here? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so that is a bit of a paradox, huh? Coming from a military background. I was a military scientist, physicist, mathematician, uh, but at heart, a big libertarian, a big believer in making the world a freer, nicer place. So I, I discovered this whole Bitcoin thing a number of years ago and figured this was, this is the ticket. This is a revolution going on. So I wanted to be a part of it. Now here I am. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is, I think one of the most interesting things that's going on in the industry is we're tinkering with this idea of, of governance and decentralized systems. So a lot of people talk about decentralization as if it's some end virtue in itself, but I think that uh, what I wanna challenge everyone here to, to do is to really think about what that means and why we're doing it in the first place. Okay, so I, I hope that I can give you some good motivation for that. So yeah, my background uh, was, was in, the, in the Air Force actually working uh, satellite radar systems and then launch vehicles, you know, those rockets that go up all the time. Uh, but then I, I discovered economics and finance, so that's where I, uh, I took a break from that old career, went back for my PhD, and I'm actually doing my dissertation in crypto finance. So it's a very interesting area, uh, a lot going on, but it's extremely new. So, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging from an academic perspective, but I'm at the University of South Carolina, and they give me a wonderful opportunity to teach a blockchain course. So besides being, uh, you know, my, my big reason that I'm here is because I'm a co-founder of Zen Cash, which is, uh, more than just a privacy coin, it's more of a social movement, um, and, and we're building a privacy ecosystem that I think is gonna do some really, really interesting things we already are. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much for having me. I love, I love Warsaw already, and thank you for my team for being here. Um, it, it's, it's awesome actually uh, putting faces to names. So let me just jump right in. I have a lot of slides, probably more than I have time to go over, but I wanted to start by, uh, are there any cypherpunks in the crowd? Do you guys even know what this term is? Because this was, this was the, the, the heart of, of Bitcoin. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love the, the hands out there, that's great. Not, not enough of them though, but this was the heart of, of Bitcoin. It was kind of a, a challenge to this concept of, this 100 year old concept of money and state being one thing. So this was a challenge. Was if you look at the Genesis block for Bitcoin and the, the message that Satoshi put in there, it was a reaction to the bank bailouts. So fundamentally, Bitcoin had its start from trying to separate money from the state. Now this is a very, very interesting challenge that went against a hundred year history, at least, for this concept of money. Okay, so, so fast forward from 2009 to today, and there's this already this explosion in, in the industry. Now I know you're, you're seeing a whole, a whole range of different types of organizations and companies uh, that are talking to you in, in this blockchain space. Uh, we are part of this grassroots part of the space, this part, part of this, uh, you know, more of a social movement than a company, okay, right? So we're, we're a nonprofit. We're not looking to, to make money by selling products. We're creating technology and we're giving it to the world. And I think there's a paradigm shift for the way that business gets conducted. So the reason I, why I bring up the, the cyberpunk dream was because uh, cryptocurrencies now offer the first viable chance to make this, this reality happen. And, and, and the objective was always to use strong cryptography as a tool to make the world freer, more of a fairer place, uh, so that everyone in the world, no matter where you're born, has equal opportunities, uh, both economically and for other, other uh, human rights, particularly privacy. <coughs> Okay, so that's where we come from. Then we start talking about this concept of decentralization. And it, I, I don't know if everyone really knows what it means or if anyone really cares. Now for a big part of the industry, it doesn't matter. If you're a business and you're leveraging blockchain technology, decentralization uh, you know, may or may not be important to you. A lot, of, a lot of businesses are leveraging private blockchains, so decentralization really doesn't matter to them. Now for the public blockchains, like for us at Zencash, Decentralization is extremely important because we are, we are pushing this idea that every human being has the right to privacy. We don't care where you live, what jurisdiction you're in, and what the people in your jurisdiction think about that. Right? We're creating technology that's equally accessible to anyone in the world. So for us, it's extremely important to be truly decentralized, which means we need to think about what that really means. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about 
an actual way that you can measure a concept of decentralization and make sure that your project is actually trying to achieve this objective. Okay, so fortunately for us, we can leverage some concepts in economics, like the Gini coefficient or Lorentz curve, where we can actually decompose public blockchains into subsystems and measure, according to some, some standardized metric, of what we mean by decentralization, okay? So for a curve like this, if you have absolute equality, then you're gonna, you're gonna be on the straight line, 45 degree line, okay? If you have severe inequality, like economists often invoke this, uh, this metric for measuring income inequality, you're gonna be much closer, okay, over here. So just keep this, this graphic in mind, and we can start measuring, uh, say, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Zen Cash according to a metric like this. So the way we start to do that is we de decompose these public blockchains into their, e their subsystems. Okay, so you can think of, for instance, miners as being, as being a, you know, one subsystem of a blockchain project. Okay, you, do you want one big miner uh, with all the hash power of the system or do you want to have it as distributed as possible? Now it depends what you want from this. Okay, if you want censorship resistance and you want to protect against say 51% attacks, clearly you want to distribute the hash rate across a broad ecosystem, right? So it's not heavily concentrated. But the same thing is true for things like exchanges. Now, I'll tell you for Zen Cash, we, we have uh, half a dozen exchanges that we're traded on. One dominant exchange that has oftentimes like 98% of our trading volume, Bittrex. Okay, so to me, this represents a single point of failure where if, if Bittrex goes down, they get hacked, something goes on, say they did list us for some reason, that's, that's a really big deal to us. So every project out there needs to consider also the sources of their liquidity. Where do they get the trading volume? You want to spread that out as well. Um, you want to look at your code base itself. Now, this is something that challenged me when I first, thought, first saw it, was having a, a decentralization in your actual code base. So most projects have one code base. Okay, Bitcoin at best, you could say maybe had three or four different code bases. Bitcoin Unlimited being the most popular secondary one. But even with the split now, that's changed. All right, so if you want to be truly censorship resistant, you may want to think about having multiple code bases distributed around the world. Okay, uh, nodes. This is something that I think we're, we're uh, doing really well with Zencash, was we, we tweak the economics of our system to compensate people to run a node, like a full node that has enhanced security. So for those that don't know, a node is basically a copy of your software that retains a full copy of your blockchain, that processes transactions and makes sure that uh, the system is running well and it provides for security of your system as well. You wanna have as many nodes out there in the world and you don't want them to be all clustered in one area. You know, the worst case scenario, the extreme edge, edge case would be if you have one node. Okay, well, that's not really censorship resistant. You take down that one node and your entire network goes down. Okay, so what we're doing is we're paying people to set up nodes all over the world and asking them to do some things for us, like add a valid certificates so we can have end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, so projects need to think about their node architecture and decentralizing that. Um, the number of developers in your community, even Bitcoin itself that has, I don't know, 150 or more uh, core developers on the, on the project, it, it, look at the number of comments and the number of comments of substance. And you, you're a much smaller number of actually active developers. So you, you, again, you you probably want to decentralize the number of developers that you have on your system as well. Get as many as you can and distribute them around the world. Make sure they're not all working, say, in the same office. Um, ownership. Now, ownership is a big problem for a lot of coins out there, or a lot of these projects, because the founders will start the project and just keep a big portion of the, the coin supply for themselves or the token supply for themselves. Okay, so that's not, not um, you know, necessarily a bad thing if you're running a company Sure, owners of the company should be compensated for taking the risk and starting it, but if you're trying to do kind of a social movement like we are and have a cryptocurrency, not necessarily a, a particular company, you want to have as broadly distributed a money supply as possible. All right, so these are six subsystems that I challenge every blockchain project, public blockchain projects, to take a look at for yourselves and figure out how you can further decentralize. Now, here's a quick snapshot for Bitcoin. Remember how I gave you that Lorentz curve uh, graph? Well, you can look for the subsystems of Bitcoin. Miners, now miners are notoriously concentrated for Bitcoin in terms of at least massive server farms, say, out of China. Okay, well, that curve's actually not too bad. Go to the number of uh, unique clients. Well, like I said, you've got one big client there. Uh, number of developers, you've got a handful of developers that actually do most of the 
you know, software contributions. And by subsystem here, you can see Bitcoin itself is not particularly decentralized, despite having the moniker of being a, a decentralized, massively distributed project. Now, if you look at it for Ethereum, it's the exact same thing. Uh, now, these, for, to give credit where credit's due, uh, Balaji from 21Co came up with this metric, and these graphs come from him and from his team. Now, what this means is, is that if you are not particularly de decentralized, your system is vulnerable. Now, you're vulnerable across all subsystems. So, for a <laughs> number of de developers, you got maybe five core developers here with almost all the comments. You know, if you, with over 51% of the comments. Number of uh, you know, miners for your system to have a 51% attack, and so on. Each subsystem is actually uh, ve very concentrated for Bitcoin. Even the money supply, you've got a handful of people that own 51% or more of the money supply for Bitcoin. Okay, so is this, when you, when you want to create your own coin, your own, your own ecosystem, would you consider something like this fair? Okay, so fairness has uh, you know, a whole bunch of assumptions behind that concept. But for me, I want to have as broadly of a distributed system as I can across all of these subsystems. So this gets me to the you know, crypto economics. Applying cryptography and economics uh, in, in a way that we're aligning incentives so that we have uh, good long-term sustainability. And we talk about this concept of governance. Like how do you manage this system in a way that it can be decentralized, but at the same time coordinate actions and come to consensus so that people can actually make decisions and move forward on projects. So what I like to think of here is we're adding two additional subsystems to Balaji's initial six subsystem model. Okay, the two systems, the subsystems that I think are extremely important are the funding model. Are you gonna have a, a long-term sustainable funding model or are you just looking to get rich quick right away? Okay, what's gonna happen in 10 or 20 years? Are you gonna be able to sustain yourself if say you, you've taken a big fundraising, you do a, a big ICO and you make $100 million today and then you go and you allocate that to projects. In, in the best case scenario, you do a good job with early investments. Well, what do you do 10 years from now when your money runs out? Are you long-term sustainable? Is your project viable? The governance aspect is huge. Now, this, this uh, was crippling Bitcoin for a while, this whole scaling debate with Bitcoin, you know, the block size issue, and then the, the big reason for why Bitcoin ended up splitting between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Okay, so there was this, there were preference clusters within the community of what they wanted to do with the project. What, what were some of these key technical specifications that they wanted to maintain or change? And they couldn't come to terms on that, so they ended up forking. So we need to think about governance from a multifaceted perspective of how you create a sustainable project. Okay? The first one that I think uh, is the low-hanging fruit that we can talk about and try to solve right now is the blockchain funding models. So we've got a few different funding models. The first was Bitcoin. And Bitcoin started as the classic open source project where basically people donate their time. You've got developers that donate the code, you know, they work on their free time, they don't get compensated. You've got other investors or you know, people that say set up a, a you know, merchant store that accepts Bitcoin. Well, you're not being compensated by the network directly, you're just doing these services because you're trying to support the network on your own. And that's great, but it's hard to support a full ecosystem when you're not compensating you know, the various stakeholders of that ecosystem. The second um, funding model that came about was something called proof of stake. Now proof of stake is, you know, technically just means you're swapping out the consensus mechanism, proof of work mining for uh, some proof of stake randomization process for appending the ledger. But uh, it, it also introduced a new funding model where people would create a proof of stake coin and then retain a portion of the money supply for themselves or for the project. Uh, and then they would allocate the, this retained, this kind of reserve money supply to project, you know, um, to pay developers, pay marketing campaigns, and so forth to try to grow the project. But it was all from having this kind of lump sum funding up front from when the coin was created. The next one, which we're currently in the middle of a, a gold rush, is this ICO movement, this initial coin offering stuff. So here's where people realize, well, we could do kind of like a, you know, like an equity offering, it, it, or like a, an IPO, which is where the name comes from, where we can raise money through crowdfunding now. So we can take a lump sum up front, and we can invest in all this cool stuff, we can pay developers, we can build up this project, basically run a business by doing a massive crowdfunding. It started off, you know, pretty big actually. Some of the early ICOs were raising millions of dollars, and that used to be big. Now, back in the day, if you, if you were an entrepreneur, and you wanted to raise money because you had a good business idea, you would actually go out and you know, fund it yourself, maybe 
have some early partners, some family, friends, and then you would build a prototype. You'd get some early customers, test it out, and if you did well, you would approach a venture capital group or, or angel investors. Maybe they would give you a few hundred thousand dollars, and you'd incrementally improve your business, your products, and if you're doing well, they'll incrementally fund you more. Well, that's kind of gone. Well, the whole venture capital industry, angel investing still goes on, but now people are raising millions or hundreds of millions of dollars by writing a white paper and floating, you know, building a website. And people are just giving them a ton of money without really doing due diligence necessarily and knowing what they're buying. Right? Do they have any equity rights and claim of ownership on the businesses that are being created? You know, do the, is, is this like a debenture or like a debt offering where there's a promise to repay them for something? Do they have claim to revenue streams? What is it? Oftentimes there's no claim to anything. It's basically kind of utility where you get this token and you can therefore participate somehow in some network, which could be fine. But there's a whole bunch of economic issues with this. There, there's, there's good and there's bad associated with that. So the third model that we use for Zen Cash, I think is uh, more long-term sustainable. What we do is an incremental funding model uh, we call a treasury model. That means we, we take a, a diversion of block rewards. So every block that's mined, there's a portion that typically goes to miners for doing that. We still do that, but a portion gets uh, siphoned off into a community fund and to reward other stakeholders. Okay, so it's incremental, so we're not getting hundreds of millions of dollars up front and then you know, just promising the world we'll do good things with it. Instead, we're getting a little bit of money with every block that's mined, and if the market likes what we're doing, the value of our budget's increasing. If they don't like what we're doing, the value is decreasing. But importantly, in the long term, we have a sustainable funding model. Ten years from now, we know that we're going to still have a budget, okay? no matter what I do. And what I find really important as well from an economics perspective is that every business could be considered kind of like a, uh, you know, some cl has, has a cloud of real options that they, that they could exercise at some point in the future. We don't know what the real options for every business is going to be, say, two years from now, five years from now. Who knows what the investment opportunity set is going to look like? So I think it's far superior to have incremental funding over time so that you know in five years when your investment opportunity set changes, say a new technology comes around, now you can invest in that versus if you get all of your money up front, you, how are you gonna time phase that budget in a rational way you know, that makes sense and is sustainable? Now, that's funding. Funding is extremely important. You need resources to do things. Okay? You need resources to pay people to do things. Uh, but you also need to know how these resources get allocated. So that's the next step that we're, we're, we're focusing really hard on is we're looking at how, uh, well, two, two types of governance. Now, there's low-hanging fruit for governance, which is how you allocate your resources. And then there's a the harder problem for governance, which is how you make decisions on, say, software upgrades, something that they would call a hard fork. If you have a software upgrade that's not backwards compatible with your previous code. Okay? Now, these are serious issues in the space. And I'll tell you the easy one to solve, and I, I say easy almost tongue-in-cheek because there's a, a lot of research that goes into it, but it's easier, is the funding one. How do we come together as a community in a decentralized manner that's provably fair to come to consensus on how, how to allocate resources? Um, so that's what we're trying to do now with Zencash. We're trying to decentralize this because censorship resistance is very important to us. But at the same time, we know that we're doing trade-offs on centralization versus decentralization. Decentralization isn't necessarily a good thing all the time because it does introduce inefficiencies and in processes. If you had one benevolent dictator that, say, was God making all decisions because this person was all-knowing, all-powerful, and knew the exact right thing to do all the time, one decision maker would be perfectly fine, would be the optimal, actually. The reality is human beings are not like that, and we're imperfect, we have imperfect information, so we need to figure out how to make rational decisions in ways that might be inefficient, but are fair, and in the long run will have uh, good outcomes that we can learn from. So I've, I've written out here uh, a bunch of properties that I call desirable for any kind of system. Okay, so I think inclusiveness, for me, is extremely important. For a grassroots community project like Zencash, it is extremely important for us to be inclusive. By that, I mean everyone in the world should have equal opportunity to participate. Okay? There should be no artificial walls or barriers to entry just because someone's born in a different country or has some different background. Okay? It should be completely inclusive to anyone. It should be provably fair. Now, provably fair means you should have complete audits, visibility into the way processes are working, and you should not have any weird things where there are a few uh, dominant uh, agents within the ecosystem that could or dominate the entire ecosystem. Uh, there, there's this efficiency thing. So we know that decentralization, you know, um, 
on average, is not going to be as efficient as centralization for certain things. But we still want to have within the decentralization space some element of efficiency. That we, but most importantly, I think that the, the, the most uh, dominant processes in the long run are kind of evolutionary. So you have to be able to learn from feedback. So number one, you have to have a feedback mechanism. And number two, you have to be able to incorporate that feedback to be able to grow and pivot and change over time. Okay, so these are the important elements of a governance model that we think about. And what we're doing with Zencash, well, we're trying to decentralize everything for a good reason because we're a privacy project. Um, so for us, that's really important. We're starting with the budget allocation decisions. We think that's the low hanging fruit. Uh, and what we're doing specifically is we have our, our version one uh, proposal submission and voting system is going to come out in the market in the next couple of weeks. But even more interesting is we have a deep R&D project. Actually, we're leveraging re um, amazing research from this, this company called IOHK. Uh, they did a couple years worth of game theoretic research into voting mechanisms and how you implement them into blockchain protocols. And we're going to be building this on Zencash. So to me, that's the most fascinating aspect of our project is we're going to build into our protocol a provably fair uh, voting system so that anyone in the world can participate. Um, and the way we're doing this is, well, putting everything on chain, which is extremely important so that it's not easily censored. Uh, we're going to have full transparency and audibility, and we're leveraging zero knowledge, uh, zero, zero knowledge cryptography to implement uh, secret ballots in the system, which then goes to making uh, your voting mechanism uh, more fair. Um, it prevents some issues that we have with democracies when people can see uh, what, how people are voting, and we make it impossible to censor. So the, the proposal or the, the protocol level uh, system, I, I guess I don't have enough time to really go into a lot of detail, but uh, we're trying to create a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization that is actually decentralized and actually autonomous. And in fact, I view this as an evolutionary process, so I don't want one single DAO. In fact, I want to have multiple competing DAOs around the world built on our system that are competing with each other and helping the system evolve symbiotically. Um, so we, we need to make sure if this is going to be fully inclusive, anyone in the world should be able to participate, which means we have to have a nice um, standardized proposal submission process that is easily understood, simple, and anyone can participate in by just having a, you know, multiple points of entry where they can submit their proposals and be seen by people in the world and not just be overshadowed by other people, maybe dominant proposals that um, you know, early adopters might be able to do. Uh, we, we, uh, we're, you, we're leveraging uh, some cool game theory with our, um, with our, uh, our you know, uh, voting model here. So we, we know that you have to incentivize people to do the right thing, right? Or you can't just rely on people to do the right thing because they you know, somehow have the best morals in the world and, and aren't going to you know, try to take advantage. You need to make sure that the economic incentives actually discourage people from um, you know, trying to attack the system. You want to reward people for doing the right thing. Okay, so one simple thing that we're gonna to do to overcome voter apathy is to reward people for voting. So if you're a good, like a good steward or a good stakeholder of our ecosystem and you're triaging proposals, you're, you're looking at them, you're trying to help us allocate resources well, you're gonna be paid for doing that. So to vote, you're gonna be paid. And I think that this is a really critical thing that would be really cool if we did in democracies to actually get people to get out and vote and have the right incentives to do that. And importantly, we're using zero knowledge uh, technology so that we can use secret ballots that are then revealed after the voting. One big thing in democracies, and, and particularly in the US, I don't know how it is all over the world, but we have a two party system. And depending, you know, I, I know a lot of libertarians, for instance, and they, they always tell me they voted for Republicans or Democrats, and I ask them why. And they say, well, because libertarians had no chance of winning, so why would I vote for them? So they voted for someone that they didn't want to vote for necessarily, but they thought it was maybe marginally better than the other candidate. I think that's a shame. So we're going to remove that problem in our system, where we're going to use a voting system where, uh, number one, you can't see which proposals are dominating, because if you see that one proposal has 90% of the votes, you're not going to vote for another one. Right? So if you, if you obscure the, the winners or the, the people that are leading in the race, then you have more of a fair chance for all the other proposals that might not have previously had a chance. Uh, and we're also going to have the ability for uh, voters to be able to delegate their stake. So the way that I see this from like a corporate finance perspective is extremely uh, fascinating what we're doing because I see the emergence of potentially a meritocracy-based executive um, you know, suite here. So rather than people being a CEO or CFO or these other, you know, fancy, fancy labeled executives because 
they come from Harvard, some other privileged background. Instead, we have a meritocracy where if you're doing well and you build a name for yourself, a reputation within the community, you are going to have people delegate their, their voting stake to you because you're both being rewarded. So if, if you're, you have a significant stake in the system, but you don't want to pay attention to all the proposals, you just don't have time, maybe that's not your thing. Or maybe you think that there's someone in your community that you really trust and respect, they do an amazing job, they have a knack for triaging proposals and allocating resources. You delegate your stake to them and it's a win-win. But I see here the emergence of a meritocracy-based uh, leadership group rather than just having you know, more of a privilege-based system. Robert, you're almost unstoppable. Okay, Time's right. Up. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. I've got a lot of other slides, but basically, I think we're changing the world one block at a time. And I encourage everyone, if you like, if you like what we're doing, well, number one, check out, you know, don't be a passive bystander as we're making history here. Go out and try to change the world yourselves. And definitely check us out too, if you get a chance and, and you know, we're around here. We have a, a little ghetto looking booth. You can come and say hi, and we'll, we'll chat your ears off. Cool, thank you. Robert Villeoni, Zencash. Thank you very much, Robert. Unfortunately, we have no time left for questions. So once again, thank you.